For more, let's welcome in Jesse Rosenthal. He's senior analyst and head of U.S. financials at Credit Sites. Our own Mike Santoli joins as well, and it's good to have you both here. Jesse, I'll start with you because you were sort of early or and or accurate to point out some problems with SVB. So I'm all the more interested to know why you don't think this is a broader indictment of the regional banks here. Yeah, well, I think it's important to kind of uh, segregate between a liquidity crunch crisis, which is what's gripping the fear of the markets right now, and what actually happened with SVB, which ultimately ended up being a solvency problem. And so big picture, the solvency problem with SVB lied in an accounting quirk with the securities they were holding. Basically, they were holding a bunch of underwater, but very importantly, zero risk assets. U.S. government treasuries, agency, MBS, that if you marked it to market, wiped out the entire book equity of the bank. They are quite literally the only bank in the U.S. that was in that position. But so what are we to make then of this number that $630 billion, Jesse, uh, would be the whole if we had the entire banking system kind of marking the similarly to market? First of all, that does not drive insolvency, right? The, the banking system has so much more capital than, than it had 10, 15 years ago that they can actually absorb those marks unlike uh, Silicon Valley Bank. So, so the system would still have excess uh, equity capital. Secondly, and this is where the liquidity comes in, if they don't have to sell it, then they can just hold on, and this is the liquidity component, because again, we know exactly what these assets are worth, and more specifically, we know exactly you will get a hundred cents at par if you can wait till repayment. And I would add, this is also where the Fed's facility on Sunday night cannot be understated because they now give the ability to take these underwater securities, go to the Fed and get a hundred cents on the dollar without ever actually having to sell them and right. take the write down. And, and yet, Mike, we've still seen the banks trading like under significant amount of pressure. Why do you think that is? Well, yeah, I would grant that uh, SVB seemed an extreme uh, to the point of, of being an outlier, but it still reflected the potential pressures on other banks, not so much for an immediate liquidity crisis, but what drives behavior changes. It's just kind of a, a second look at our exposures, where we have duration, uh, what the losses are, wh the whole what-if scenario, and the pulling of deposits from smaller banks that need them more than the bigger banks it's going to. I think that's, in a macro sense, to me, what matters more uh, and why I don't really think we're talking about some kind of uncontrolled chain reaction uh, in terms of deposit flight from the system that's going to weaken it. Uh, by the way, that $600 billion loss is a lot smaller now than it was when people took that snapshot, given the rally in bonds. So I think you've had a little bit of wiggle room created here, but I don't know what it means for the credit impulse in the economy. I don't know what it means for the smaller banks in terms of their risk appetites. And that, to me, is uh, is coloring the view of economic growth, sure. uh, even if you can set aside SVB as a particular case in terms of its stress. The other thing, Jesse, is that if you took a snapshot of the banks prior to the SVB issue, and I can understand your point that they wouldn't necessarily have to make these four sales, but now in an era of deposit flight, has, uh, do we know yet? I mean, the extent to which deposits have changed hands and then forced institutions to have to react uh, just like they did in SVB's case. Yeah, we dumped it. And, you know, that is, I will acknowledge, sort of the tricky component here. And I think why the Fed moved so quickly over the weekend, you know, bank liquidity crises, you do not want to fool around with because the situation can change extremely quickly. You know, Silicon Valley Bank is, is a perfect example here. 25% of their depositors at least tried to get out the door on Thursday alone. Um, the reality is the way banks work, and I would urge everyone to go back and rewatch uh, 80 years ago, It's a Wonderful Life. The reality is that almost no bank can withstand that type of bank run. Um, definitionally is not how the industry works. Uh, but more broadly speaking, there's still a lot of cash. There's still a lot of already marked securities to be able to absorb it. And, and I agree with the prior point that I think it's much, much more likely that we're seeing deposit migration up the size scale in banks rather than a broader liquidity crisis for the system. Would you, Jesse, put any other banks uh, in your crosshairs now, or do you think that that is a, a waste of time exercise? 
I don't think it's a waste of time exercise, but one of the one of our kind of theses here is that the more and more we can prove out Silicon Valley as an extreme outlier, um, and it is in virtually every single case, I think the more and more we should get comfortable with how the rest of the banks are sitting. You know, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, like I said, was a series of missteps starting with an egregious asset liability mismanagement. Um, and, and duration mismatch that does not exist at other banks. And that largely comes down to the vagaries of their deposit base, which yeah. is extremely highly correlated. Um, and that's just not the case with the rest of the system.